Good afternoon. It's a big pleasure uh, to, to be here. It has been a, a pleasure and also very stimulating as I will show to work with Francois over the, something like 20 years. So I'm very happy to be here. So I propose this title to try to give something a bit funny and uh, seeing that there were also nice titles. And then I, I became nervous in uh, preparing the, the talk, wondering my, uh, if I had uh, exaggerated for the starting from one. So the number is about the number of genotypes. So I was happy. Uh, the first paper I looked in was two genotypes uh, here, this uh, Muller et al. paper. But the second one I looked at was uh, indeed one genotype. So There are indeed uh, papers with one genotype. Uh, and uh, then, as I will show, we uh, interacted with Francois to increase to more than 100 genotypes rather quickly. And this was a real breakthrough uh, for us to get a very important data about the, the population we developed. And then uh, I will uh, go briefly through uh, genomic prediction, which is a way to address their infinity. So I hope my title is not totally misleading. And in any case, the, the talk will try to wrap up uh, the key steps of this journey uh, over something like uh, 20 years. So uh, this will be about uh, the evolution of our field. So our discipline, quantitative genetics, was mostly uh, statistical before the advent of the dense genotyping, first with uh, RFLPs. So RFLPs was a nightmare. You were basically basing uh, in radioactivity for several weeks before getting any result, if any. Uh, but then we could produce data, and uh, rapidly we saw that it was a good idea to develop what we call segregating populations, uh, where starting from two parents, you, you get... Uh, Uh, mosaics from the parental genomes, and with that we can map factor uh, in underlying the, the, the quantitative threats of interest, along with mapping what we were uh, calling at the time candidate genes, that, that were genes coming from another community, the more uh, molecular uh, uh, biology community, which could be candidates underlying these QTLs. And so we developed uh, in the lab Uh, our own material, starting from a very nice uh, hybrid from the time, uh, crossing what we call iodine with uh, France uh, number two line that has been a great success uh, of INRA, and developing uh, uh, recombinant in red lines to do that. And this is the population that was adopted by LEPS and uh, uh, analyzed uh, with a lot of courage by uh, Mathieu Raymond. I guess this was heavy work, and uh, I'm very proud of this uh, publication with Francois Group in uh, Plant Physiology uh, uh, 2003, so 20 years ago. And what was this publication saying? First, that uh, with uh, 100 individuals la like that, we could map uh, QTLs, uh, that is to say position on the chromosomes factors that were involved in va the variation of this threat. You will recognize uh, LEPS uh, favorite uh, trait, intrinsic uh, elongation weight. I won't list uh, them all. That will be uh, probably done much better uh, during the afternoon. And so first insight in the genetics of this trait, but also Francois always has had, uh, I, and I said that very sincerely, uh, a bit of a personal touch in the genetics of all these things. And uh, he, he said, okay, it's nice to look at QTL, but uh, let's take 100 to map QTL, but let's keep 11 or so to check if what we find uh, with the QTLs uh, is predictive. And I, I think it was working decently well, if I remember correctly. So that was uh, a, a good, uh, good idea. So this was our first uh, cooperation. But this, uh, uh, of course, was not uh, completely satisfactory. Why? Because we only had two parents. Two parents is very limited compared to the diversity of maize, which is very broad. <laughs> And so we spent a lot of time and energy trying to expand the diversity that was addressed. And first, with two approaches. Uh, one was to go into what we call multiparental designs. And I don't think we formally cooperated with LEPS with that. Uh, but uh, still, uh, LEPS used the second population I will speak uh, now about. And the other things we worked on is what is called meta-analysis of uh, this biparental study, where basically you take all the studies that are available, you make projection, you pile up all the QTLs that have been found, you soon realize that it's a total mess, uh, and then you go into heavy statistics to 
uh, propose a consensus of all these individuals and find what we call meta-QTLs. And uh, this was uh, for flowing time here. But uh, then a key player uh, entered again, Claude, uh, here also in the audience, of course. And uh, Claude, with also here courage, went into the software and applied that to the experiments they had conducted at labs on the other. I think one is uh, from Jean-Marcel, probably. And uh, mapped uh, meta-QTLs along the, the, the maze uh, genome. And this showed that there were many of these meta-QTLs uh, and that the, the determinism of the traits was probably highly complex with uh, many small effect Q, QTLs. So I, I don't go into the, the details. Then, next step, even more diversity, but uh, here, uh, uh, dense genotyping had appeared. And so we could uh, go, for, as I will illustrate, for uh, uh, dense genotyping. And this made it possible, it's a bit a busy slide, to exploit uh, collections with a broad diversity, not to create new uh, uh, populations, but directly uh, phenotype and genotype the individuals of the collections and go into what we call association genetics, when you benefit from the historical process underlying the pedigree to get a lot of recombination, a lot of diversity. And uh, we have played a lot with that, uh, with different panels uh, from different origins, and uh, with uh, labs in drops and amazing, we assemble uh, a, a specific panel. And here again, uh, a touch from Francois was to say, okay, I, I, I want to go into this association uh, genetics business, but I don't want to spend a lot of efforts to map flowing time QTLs, I remember that. So we should narrow the, the, the phenology. So we did our best. We went to Hungary, Italy, to gather lines we, to keep within the uh, flowing time window that was preconized by Francois. And uh, I, so I will show this uh, work well. And I want to take here the opportunity to mention that this is a great opportunity to take advantage of genetic resource collection. And we are fortunate at INRAE to have uh, Saint Martin de Vinx uh, station, who does a great job in this field. So, uh, before uh, analyzing finding QTL, we need to genotype. And so, with my colleagues here, uh, or let's say they would be more honest, uh, Sandra, Stéphane, Delphine, we uh, went for a number of techniques from uh, uh, 50,000 SNPs to 600 SNPs, uh, 600 more, we compared all that to assemble a data set with 1 million. And if you look at the segment of the chromosome, all the lines are here uh, as uh, rows, and the, the markers are uh, in columns. It's a very small segment. You go in, you find this kind of mosaic. Uh, red is the reference genome. Black is the alternative allele. And you find uh, something that I really like, this kind of mosaics. You, you see that uh, some uh, uh, lines share this B73 uh, segment, that, that some of the lines share uh, a segment here th that you have very specific lines with specific alleles and all that. And uh, with uh, appropriate statistics, you go into the genetics of your favorite trait, which can be a uh, yield in a network, it can be platform traits, as a, a number of you here contributed. And this is a beautiful experiment with 29 contrasted environments, and we could find very uh, high, I think this is the best we ever found with uh, Emily which was a um, high temperature adaptation uh, peak, QTL. And uh, I hope it's the right, right cartoon. Uh, colleagues, uh, and Francois really liked that, uh, showing that uh, the effect was varying according to uh, environmental conditions. So we detected a couple of others. Uh, unfortunately, one was a flowing time QTL, but uh, not all of them were flowing time QTL, that's for sure. So final part, or, uh, before just finishing, uh, it's uh, about genomic prediction. So genomic prediction, to make it very simple, you have a reference uh, population, phenotyped, uh, genotyped. I should have put here a, a LEPS platform image, probably. Genotyped, you estimate marker effects, and then you... Uh, the, the idea now is not so much to uh, have, uh, l to localize QTLs. You, you accept to reduce a little bit your cognitive ambition to increase prediction efficiency. What is more important here is that the, the statistical model is efficient to predict the value of new individuals based only 
on their uh, genotype, and this can be applied to different uh, materials. So we checked in uh, amazing with uh, Simon Rio here that it was working uh, very, very nicely. Uh, it was not just uh, repredicting uh, subgroups within the populations, even it works uh, wi within group. And uh, a major uh, contribution, again, uh, with Emily, Francois, in cooperation with uh, Fred uh, here in the audience, was to apply that to uh, this uh, model that I won't describe in, in details, but here you have genotypic main effect, genetic sensitivities, coming to environmental sensitivity to environmental conditions, environmental variables, uh, and, and so on. And uh, having this model in hands, having uh, environmental variables from existing or virtual environments, having genomic prediction of the parameters, you may ultimately predict any genotype in any environmental condition. And this is uh, the beauty of what is shown in this uh, uh, ca cartoons. Of course, it will work all the better that you are close to a known genotype or known environment, but still the, the concept is very uh, convincing. So this was, uh, let's say, uh, for the future of uh, breeding. And one very interesting uh, thing to conclude uh, that uh, Francois and the uh, colleagues uh, di did was to go back into what has been the genetic progress over the, the last decades. And so here, what is uh, phenotype and genotype are uh, varieties that were released, I mean, uh, put on the market at different time periods. They all are evaluated in the same environmental conditions. And these uh, cartoons clearly show, it has been uh, presented briefly already, uh, a major uh, genetic gain, both in optimal and uh, uh, limiting uh, co conditions, uh, which is uh, very important in terms of communication. And uh, on top of that, uh, uh, LEPS colleagues could uh, determine which traits were involved in this progress and which traits were not involved. And there has been a lot of debate with uh, private uh, breeders uh, about that. And uh, in any case, this gives a clues about how selection has acted and what could be the future if uh, traits have not been involved, could we use them and so on, and uh, we may discuss that a, a bit later. So to conclude, uh, I would say that Francois clearly has the vision, uh, this has been uh, said uh, already, uh, there is a, a, a legacy that is really important and I would like with this slide to put some uh, Elements about uh, the vision. So I, for me, one key uh, contribution of Francois has been to always think in, in terms of functional modeling. And I remember he hated this uh, uh, more uh, statistical, uh, uh, descriptive statistics. We have had uh, numerous debates uh, uh, on that, but I, I think you were right. Uh, probably I would say I'm, I, I'm biased towards compromise, so I would say both are good, but uh, in any case it was really good to go towards functional modeling. Uh, uh, there was a, a, a major uh, advance guided by this modeling in the implementation of original phenotyping protocols to estimate uh, model parameters and then implement in phenom in a in a um, broad scale, and uh, Francois, not being a geneticist himself in the beginning, was an excellent student and uh, learned quickly, and always had, had a good intuition of uh, genetic approaches, uh, put insight in the material choice, uh, as I said a moment ago. And so this led to very interesting genetic results, both cognitive, traits of interest, QTS, and so on, and uh, this mantra that alleles can have a positive or negative effects depending on environment, that we think we, we, we meditate a, a lot, also in terms of prediction. Uh, this diagnostic on the evolution of varieties to be used uh, to now design the next breeding programs. And uh, to finish, I, I would like to propose a couple of uh, remaining questions, even if much has been done. Uh, so I think we will rapidly agree that we would like to further expand the diversity that is analyzed, targeting sources with uh, a priori specific adaptation from the tropics, for instance. Uh, 
a question is which level of segmentation of breeding program varieties is desirable to address climate change? Should we go for sorghum-like uh, maize uh, in terms of uh, ecophysiological behavior? Uh, something that is a bit personal on, uh, in my own interest is that I, I want to advertise that hybridization can be uh, a, le le uh, a, a fast way to uh, combine desirable traits. Maybe we should look more at that. And uh, I was happy to see this already in, uh, in the talk this morning, strengthen uh, cooperation with systems agronomy. And to conclude, so I learned from, uh, France, uh, from Christian Huyck that uh, someone looking for the future in pictures look in the right direction. So I, I applied that, so I, I was happy to find this one. So I would say thank you, Francois, and congratulations for vision, leadership, and the precious uh, achievement. This is a great legacy, and I know more is ongoing. And uh, uh, there are also thanks, uh, I won't speak in the name of the lab's colleagues, but I want to thank them, the ones who have listed it. This has been also very nice cooperation. Uh, acknowledge the contribution of the colleagues involved in uh, material creation, conservation, distribution, genotyping, and a couple of scientists, and we discussed this morning, uh, Dominique de Vienne, who has had some influence in uh, all this adventure, Laurence Moreau, Mathilde Cos, and uh, Stéphane Nicolas, Michel Zivi, Mélissand, and a uh, very nice uh, funding and partnership, and Alain Renieu will speak in a, in a moment. So thank you very much, and thank you again, François.